Um, I'm Matthew Spaulding, Associate President and Dean for Hillsdale College here in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the Allen P. Kirby Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship. Uh, uh, this is our extension of Hillsdale College's campus here in Washington, D.C. This is the second installment this evening of our Thomistic Institute series, Exploring Politics and Philosophy. Uh, sponsored by the Thomistic Institute, the D.C. chapter of it, and Hillsdale College uh, in Washington. Our next program, I will note for the record, is Father Thomas Joseph on the evening of March 29th, and his topic is Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness, a 13th century take on natural rights. Uh, I draw that to your attention. Uh, but tonight we turn to the question of moral restraint, an important topic throughout the history of political thought, and indeed a important topic to the American founders. Uh, to date, and for some time, historians have long debated the emphasis in the American founding on questions like rights and freedoms, on the one hand, and classical Republican concepts of moral virtue and character on the other. Some think it is contradictory to favor liberty and promote public virtue at the same time. But the founders, it seems, make both of these arguments, liberty and moral restraint, with equal fervor. There are important tensions for sure, but far from being contradictory, the concepts are, seem to be necessarily intertwined. They thought that liberty is not an open-end right to do whatever one wanted. And they make a strong distinction between liberty and licentiousness. And where licentiousness begins, one writer put it in 1776, their liberty ends. The distinction between liberty and licentiousness is implied in the very terms they used. Speaking of virtue and vice, these are the terms of classical thought and Christian theology, not modern moral relativism. And yet, here we are today, drowning in that sea of moral relativism, as you recall from our first talk. And so, not surprising, many on the left and the right today disagree over how and even whether this question of restraint can be either wise or liberating especially when it comes to the question of law. The purpose of modern liberalism, after all, is to liberate us from restraint. And within the right, we only need to think of our libertarian friends, for whom liberty without restraint is itself the highest end. So what are we to do, and how do we think through this question today? It turns out that classical thought, that of Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, brings clarity to the question the origin of law, purpose of law, and a clarity that is essential for a flourishing of the republic, and about a citizenry that is both wise and free. Our talk this evening is entitled, The Wise Restraints That Make Men Free, Freedom, Morality, and the Law. Our speaker is Father Aquinas Gilbo. Love that name. Native of Louisiana, he's an adjunct instructor in moral theology at the Dominican House of Studies. He entered the Order of Preachers, the Dominicans, um, in 2005. After several years of pastoral work in New York City, uh, Father Aquinas began doctoral studies in moral theology at the University of Freiburg, where he will soon be defending his dissertation on Charles de Connick's Apologia, Apologia for the Primacy of the Common Good. Father. Thank you, Dr. Spaulding. Allow me to begin by saying what an honor it is to be here this evening. I first heard of Hillsdale College many years ago in the college seminary, one of the priest professors in philosophy that we had. He said Hillsdale was the best liberal arts college in the country. Uh, and I wondered what was wrong with our little liberal arts college <laughs> where we were studying. But Hillsdale has always been on the map for me. And so it's, uh, it's nice to finally make contact with Hillsdale through the Kirby Center here this evening. Thank you again. For the invitation. The wise restraints that make men free, freedom, morality, and the law. Every year at Harvard University's commencement exercises, the university president salutes the law school graduates and officially declares them, quote, qualified to aid in the shaping and application of those wise restraints that make men free. 
The president's simple but solemn declaration signals to the graduates not only the importance of their chosen avocation, but also the reverence they should bring to it. The president reminds the graduates that by shaping and applying the wise constraints that make men free, the lawyer commits himself or herself to pursuing not only technical excellence in the law, but also wisdom and the freedom that wisdom promises. To be wise in the law, the president suggests to the graduates, is to know how to employ the right legal means at the right time and in the right way to bind the wills of their fellow citizens for the sake of increasing human freedom. As gripping a description of law and lawyering as this is, however, is the president's declaration to the law graduates accurate? I'm sure that upon hearing the president's words, not a few graduates are left to wonder, as we might be left to wonder, just how a restraint on human choice can lead to freedom. In our postmodern age, at least, this thought is anathema. Like all political flourishes, the often repeated description of law as the wise constraints that make men free was authored by Harvard law professor John MacArthur McGuire in 1936. It's subject to a variety of interpretations. For example, some read it as a confirmation of the wise and noble quality that law should possess. This is the reading given to McGuire's phrase in one of the church committee reports of the mid-1970s. And it's largely negative assessment of the nation's intelligence services, the report warns, the United States must not adopt the tactics of the enemy. Means are as important as ends. Crisis makes it tempting to ignore the wise constraints that make men free. But each time we do so, the, the report continues, each time the means we use are wrong, our inner strength, the strength that makes us free, is lessened. Well, recently, however, McGuire's description of law has been invoked to underscore not law's wisdom, but its usefulness as a tool to secure freedom, namely the freedom of choice. Drew Faust, Harvard's current president, recently celebrated her university's con contribution to the shaping of the American restraints that make men free. Harvard Uni University, she boasts, quote, is where Louis Brandeis shaped the constitutional right to privacy Charles Hamilton Houston prepared to do battle against racial segregation, and, the whole host of, and a whole host of individuals beginning in the 1980s laid the groundwork for, which, for what is now a constitutional right to marry whomever you love. According to Faust, law's purpose today is not only to place wise restraints on human willing in the interest of freedom, but also in the same interest of freedom to loosen the restraints imposed on choice by previous generations. In the few minutes I have this evening, I do not propose to arbitrate between conflicting interpretations of McGuire's description of law. What I propose instead is to question the paradox that McGuire supposes law to possess. McGuire's description of law as the wise restraint that makes men free turns wholly on the supposed conflict that exists between law and freedom, which for McGuire appears in legal restraint somehow being a cause of freedom. But is this true? Is law really a restraint? Is its use only to bind the will and limit choice? And what of the notion of freedom that this supposes? Is the maximization of choice, which law inherently seems to threaten, the essence of human freedom? My purpose this evening is to examine classical notions of both freedom and law that understand these two realities differently. For the ancients, law and freedom 
were closely related. They fit hand in glove, in large part because the ancients did not reduce law to a restraint on willing, nor did they reduce freedom to the issue of choice. And looking at the ancient treatment of these two topics, let's begin with freedom. One of the fruits of the renaissance of virtue ethics in the 20th century has been the firm recognition that the concept of freedom we have in, inherited from modernity is very different from the notion of freedom possessed by ancient thinkers and their medieval commentators. Beginning in the early modern period, philosophers generally and moral the theorists in particular began to gravitate toward a notion of freedom that some have termed a freedom of indifference. This notion of freedom stands in stark contrast to the more classical notion which can be termed a freedom for excellence. What distinguishes these two notions of freedom is the premium that the modern notion places on the freedom and the independence of the human will. Now it isn't the case that the classical notion had no understanding of the freedom that accompanies human choice. It certainly did, as the works of Plato and Augustine, and of Aristotle and Aquinas demonstrate. What changes in the modern notion is that the intellect and the will are no longer seen to work in tandem in the subject's deliberation and judgment and command of an act where the intellect is spontaneously inclined to truth and the will is spontaneously inclined to the good. According to the modern notion, in order for choice to be really free, and thus for the person to be really free, the will must detach itself from the intellect, such that the will can stand indifferent to the claims of truth. To be free, the will must act according to its own lights and power. To be free, the moderns thought, the will must remain unmoved before the good. To be free, the will must be moved only by itself. In modern moral theory, therefore, the will, once uncoupled from the intellect, assumes a new role in human action steps into the driver's seat. No longer subject to the will's indications about what it is good for the person to pursue, the will takes on the role of an arbiter between the promptings of the intellect on the one hand and the promptings of the passions on the other hand. The will stands above what the intellect knows to be true and what the passions desire to choose freely and indifferently between the intellect and the passions. As free, the will could also chart its own course and choose neither the promptings of the intellect or those of the passions. The heart has its own reasons about which reason knows nothing, Pascal says. Modernity's preference to regard the will as indifferent and as the indifferent arbiter between intellect and passion has a long history whose details we cannot recount now. Suffice it to say that the effects of the modern shift toward the notion of freedom as indifferent remain with us. Today it is generally accepted that the person is identified by the freedom of his will, free in the sense of being indifferent to nature and nature's ordering, indifferent to natural and revealed truth, indifferent to sense and passion, indifferent not by accident, but as a prerequisite to the will's being and remaining free. The novelty of modernity's understanding of human freedom as indifferent appears clearly when we compare it to the classical notion of freedom as the fruit of excellence. Key to the classical understanding of freedom is that freedom does not precede choice so much as it follows many instances of choosing the good. According to the ancients, a person becomes freer as he achieves higher goods in life. As a result, freedom, according to the classical understanding, 
is not the prerequisite for choice, but rather the perfection of choosing well. According to this notion of freedom, the free person is not the one who stands indifferently before the good, but rather is inclined toward it, embraces it, and frees himself to enjoy this good in its most perfect form. And since the free person is the baseball player who bats 300, the quarterback who throws for 5,000 yards a season, the pianist who can improvise a Beethoven sonata, the ice skater who can land a triple axel, the linguist who recites Virgil or Dante, the poet who masters the use of metaphor, and the chef who can make a perfect souffle. These persons are free because once drawn to a particular good, they free themselves of every ignorance and weakness that keeps them from enjoying their desired good in the most excellent way. In this sense, the free person is not just a chooser, but an achiever, one who employs choice to attain the excellent that stands before the person as an object of his desire. This point about the classical notion of freedom cannot be stressed enough. The freedom for excellence is born not from the will's standing aloof to the good, but rather from the will's desire for the good. Freedom grows out of the spontaneous attraction of the will to all that is good. This attraction of the will serves as a driving force pushing the person to pursue the good in terms both of creating opportunities for the good as well as overcoming the obstacles that impedes one's progress toward it. Drew Brees is freer than I to enjoy the good of football. Michelle Kwan is freer than I to enjoy the good of ice skating. Bobby Fischer is freer than I to enjoy the good of chess. These persons are freer than I am in all of these areas, both because they love their sports and their games more than I do, and also because they are free of the hindrances that keep them from playing their games and their sports excellently. When we apply this notion of freedom to the moral life, several interesting facts emerge. First of all, we see that freedom comes not at the beginning of one's moral maturation, but instead at the end of it. At the beginning of the moral life, one lacks freedom before the good. One's vision of the excellent is undeveloped. One's will for the, weak, for the excellent is weak. This is why chicken nuggets and grilled cheese sandwiches appear on most children's menus and not coco vin or goat cheese truffles. But step by step, the slow and persistent pursuit of the good leads one to appreciate the excellent better. And the will is strengthened by minor victories in the pursuit of virtue to take the risks necessary to win major ones. It takes the freedom of excellence to render a man his due in justice, to enjoy a fine meal in temperance, or to face down one's enemies with courage. Something else we notice about the moral life when we regard freedom not as the maximization of choice, but as the possession of the excellent, is that the possession of the excellent minimizes choice in a person's life. The higher we move toward the excellent, the more we grow in freedom, the fewer options there are that remain for us. For example, to be an NFL quarterback requires that one spend more time on the football field than on the tennis court. To be a champion skater requires that one spend more time on the ice than at the mall. To be a champion chess player requires that one spend more time playing the game with others than sitting alone at Starbucks. It's the same when we grow in the virtues. 
To grow in justice means that cheating on my taxes is no longer an option for me. To become courageous means that postponing difficult decisions is no longer an option for me. To become temperate means that daily trips to McDonald's or even the occasional look at pornography is no longer an option for me. And to lose these options for the sake of excellence does not make me less free. The loss of these options frees me to act with excellence and perfection. To think otherwise is to think that someone like Mother Teresa was free to abandon Calcutta and move to Vegas. Aristotle uses two images to make this point about the inverse relation of excellence and choice. The first involves, interesting, interestingly enough, a brick. A person can maintain his independence and indifference before the good, Aristotle says. But such a one remains free only as a brick thrown on a pile remains free from the constraints of the house. What he means by that is that the brick on the pile might appear freer than the brick in a wall. It has more options available to it. But this freedom is illusory. Though constrained by other bricks and the mortar between them, the brick in the wall is freer to do what it is that bricks do, which is to constitute parts of a wall. The brick on the pile keeps its options open, but it never achieves the excellence of brickness. The other example that Aristotle offers is more personal in nature. He compares the respective freedoms of a servant and a son in a household. Now both the servant and the son follow the commands of the father or the head of the household. But from the view of indifference, Aristotle says, the servant is freer than the son. The servant follows the orders of the head of the household to be sure but he is less restrained by the good of the household than the son is. The servant does not have responsibility for the household. He only follows orders, but is free to pursue other things at will. From the viewpoint of excellence, however, the son is freer. His life is more excellent, for it more resembles the life of the head of the household. His options are fewer, but for that reason, the son is freer to contribute to the good of the household after the manner of the father. Not out of obedience, like the servant, but by choice, like the father. These two examples of the brick in the wall and the son of the household reveal that for Aristotle, freedom is more than the ability to choose between contraries. Freedom involves surrendering to the constraints of the good to arrive freely through the perfection of intellect, will, and passion at the excellence. The distinction between the freedom of indifference and the freedom of excellence show, allows us to unravel the paradox of Maguire's description of law as the wise restraint that makes men free. Law appears only as a restraint to the one who believes that human freedom is in, eff, in essence an indifferent freedom. If the will is not inclined naturally to any good, if it does not spontaneously hunger for what is excellent, if it finds its perfection in being indifferent in the face of the good, then law is a restraint that compels choice. Law is to be resisted as unnatural, but accepted nonetheless because of the social benefit it offers the individual. On the contrary, if human freedom is, in essence, the freedom for excellence, law appears as something else. It is a necessary guide for the individual toward the common good, so that he might coordinate his activity with others to 
toward the social good he desires. Law, in this sense, is not a restraint on the will, but first and foremost, a guide for the intellect, so that the individual can act of his own prudence in striving for the excellent. Law might reduce his options, to be sure, but in doing so, law only reflects the natural restraints on choice that the good itself imposes on individuals. A restraint on choice that frees individuals who, on the social plane, act together towards the excellence of peaceful social interaction. These two notions of law are important to distinguish. Whether law is a restraint on the indifferent or a guide toward the excellent is an important thing for the lawmaker to know. After all, for whom does the lawmaker legislate? For the brick on the pile or the brick in the wall? For the servant of the household or for the son of the father? The administrative state is the regime for the indifferent. As the Julia character from President Obama's 2012 campaign makes evident. Such a state imposes certain obligations on the individual so that the individual can seemingly retain as many options as possible. By contrast, the republic is the regime for the son, the citizen, whose freedom is found in bearing responsibility for the social good. This responsibility demands a lot of the citizen. His life is less given to caprice but he is freer due to the excellence of the good he achieves. In conclusion then, if we could rewrite Maguire's description of law, we would have to expand on it a bit. Our description would sacrifice something of Maguire's poetry in exchange for accuracy. In line with Aristotle and Aquinas, we might say that law is, quote, the wise and authoritative counsel that directs men and women to the free and excellent sharing of the common good. We have mics that are going around. Okay. Well, thank you for the wonderful talk. But, um, like, when can you explain how people can say they're free when they're in prison, like the martyrs? You know, when you read their autobiographies, you know, current 20th century martyrs. Sure. I mean, there, that there is a, a freedom I, that even if one is bound physically, you know, if even their freedom of movement is hindered, there's still an excellence uh, in life that, that can be achieved. Um, certainly it's an injustice, uh, especially if they're wrongly imprisoned, say for the faith or something like that. Um, but that in itself shows us that there's something more to the reality of freedom than simply freedom of movement or freedom from injustice that even constrain uh, in that sense what one can still achieve interiorly, certainly spiritual goods, uh, but even more natural goods like truthfulness, honesty. I mean, one, one can still strive and, and be perfected in the virtues in, in those, those difficult circumstances. Doesn't mean you give excuse for that, but it shows that there is something more to freedom than simply being indifferent to the good or having options, the maximization of, of, of choice. Um, so, it's difficult to, I think the difficulty I see is finding a common ethical ground for a universe of multipolar institutions, states, and families, 
corporations. Uh, you know, in, in your example of the servant and the son, the son is more constrained with respect to the household. Right. But what about when he goes into town or right. leaves the country? He right. doesn't have any more responsibility to the household than the servant does, or very not much, as I can see, in the same situation, apart from maybe a sense of... Well, I think he would take into the public square then... Right, so once he enters the public square, yes, there's some kind of uh, sense of dignity that he has to preserve and responsibility to maintain right. the respectability of where he comes from. But when you have all these various institutions working and no one can agree on a common good, then uh, how, you know, how is it possible? And especially when everyone perceives their own interests in a different way right. or, or that, that uh, no one can agree that there's a unified uh, economy that would benefit everyone in the same just manner, then how should everyone in that universe be expected to dialogue rather than use force to, um, um, uh, you know, to uh, find the good? Yeah, I think one, that's a good question. I think just on, for the first half of it, uh, that there would still be a distinction between the, the son and the servant when entering into the, the common good because one is one already um, accustomed to taking responsibility for a good higher than his particular good. Uh, so that already preps one, you know, to be a good citizen, you know, in, in pursuing then the common good of the whole as opposed to my own particular good or even the good of my, my family, um, you know, that, that the common good presents yet a higher good um, for which the citizen bears some, some responsibility and is to be loved as common, you know, not, not, not as particular. Um, so I think that that's one hand. Now, as far as how then do people... I mean, with different points of view and different experiences come together to create you know, the common good is, is not a question we're going <laughs> to answer here tonight. I mean, one of the interesting things is, is that there was a lot of enthusiasm uh, or a lot of optimism in this regard, you know, post-World um, War II um, in the founding of the United Nations, especially Catholics who were involved there, Jacques Maritain, um, Charles Malik, and, and people like that. You can look at their writings, and they were quite optimistic as to what people from different corners of the globe could come together in agreement upon, you know, regarding what constitutes the common good, what can constitute at least a list of human rights, uh, and how we organize ourselves. Not sure we, sure we share that same <laughs> uh, confidence uh, now. Uh, and there's actual reason to, to kind of critique that, that, uh, that optimism. It's not an easy thing. Because you can agree, for instance, I mean, the example is often given that, uh, yeah, that, that children should be educated. You know. But then once you start asking, okay, well, what do we teach them? Uh, you know, well, then you're going to get, you know, a thousand and one different. So I, I, and on the one hand, I mean, this is where I think people who, who talk about dialogue, I mean, do have something to say. Because if there's going to be any, any agreement, it's going to come out of just constant conversation uh, about these types of things. Um, I also think something like subsidiarity has something to say here, too, that we're not going to reach, you know, a common understanding of these things for, say, 300 million people in the United States, but, you know, a county might be able to reach, you know, some peace <laughs> on, on these issues if we, if we allow them to. Uh, thank you for your remarks. Uh, given... Building off on that, given the discrepancies that we hear about what is the common good, and especially with the prevalence of moral relativism, isn't it a bit dangerous to empower the law to decide for all people what that goal will be, what that excellence might look like, and couldn't that backfire for what really is good and what really is excellent? Right. I mean, that's always uh, anyway, a criticism brought, brought up, and it's, it's, it's a good question. Uh, I think on the one hand, if it's, if the law gets it right, you know, and actually identifies a real good, um, then whether a particular individual recognizes it as his good or not, um, I mean, you'd want him to. Uh, and that's actually what the law can help to do by actually codifying, you know, a law like that. There is a kind of a, an instructive or kind of an ed educational aspect, uh, to law. 
And that's clear, that, that exists certainly here in the United States, that once something is made law, people think immediately it must be right and just. Um, people do take direction from, from the law. Um, so on the one hand, I mean, if the law gets it right and, 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 and does promote a real good, well, then that actually does benefit those who may not, in the beginning at least, uh, recognize it. At the same time, because of the way that, that states have developed today, I don't think it's necessarily the case that, uh, or at least in, in, in a more classical understanding, that I'm not sure there's the understanding of, of uh, how do I want to say it? The, um, or at least within democratic regimes, there is constant, again, there's the dialogue, it, it, there is constant conversation about these things. And so in the pers common pursuit of justice, I mean, there shouldn't be the concern or even the desire to, to, to impose, you know, unjustly uh, on, on others. Um, and so you do have things like minority rights and, I mean, concern for, for dissent and, and, and things like that. It just happens, though, that in, in a lot of cases, I mean, uh, legislation about the good tend, does tend to get it right. I mean, as far as, like, the big things. Um, and maybe that's where law should, at least at uh, the highest levels, sh should remain. Uh, so, if, you know, basic principles are, are, are codified in law, and then you leave it, again, to local communities to work out the details. Again, I think you, you get better, better results, uh, better, better discussion happy, I mean, happier people on the ground, that, that they're actually participating then in, in constructing their common life together, then instead of, ha instead of having it opposed, imposed upon them from, from, from the fall. Thank you for an excellent speech. <clears throat> in the current presidential campaign, especially in one of the two parties, we're hearing an awful lot about fairness. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk about the relationship between freedom and fairness in a society. That's a big question. Uh, that, I mean, that does get into questions of justice uh, and really what, what the goal of justice is. I mean, if it's, if it's absolute equality or if there's some equity, you know, that, that, that can come through, through even some type of disparity between, um, especially the results of, of, of things. Um, I'm not sure. Right. Who can't be so free? Or okay. Right. Hmm. I, mean, I think the ancients would say, I mean, that there's just kind of a natural, I mean, on those types of things, uh, there's a natural inequality you know, that, that, that reigns uh, in the world. I mean, not all of us have, to the same degree, all of the same benefits, talents, gifts. Um, but the goal of justice is still in the midst of that kind of natural inequality to render, render the other his due uh, and just due. Now, you have to serious discussions about what that do is. Um, our current political, in the current political climate, we're very concerned about identifying each and every specific right that, that, that someone can claim. That may not be the best, you know, because now there, it, it's hard to know. Um, and again, if, if your idea of freedom is just indifference or indifferent choice, well then, if every choice is then going to be made a right, uh, with no consideration for, for the good. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, we, we've taken a, we've, I think, embarked on, on a path where we're not quite sure yet where this is gonna end as far as the, the naming of each and every, or justifying in law every choice as, as a right. I'll let the folks with the mics. Uh, <laughs> Determine the um, I think you touched on it a little bit just a moment ago, but could you, uh, you outlaid uh, two different paradigms uh, of freedom. Um, 
obviously one's more geared to who we are as humans, human flourishing, uh, our, our final end. But why is one to be preferred over the other? Why is one, uh, why should I be concerned with uh, achieving greatness or excellence over what I want in the moment? Eric Hoynes would just say, because that's who you are. <laughs> because the goods that perfect you attach not to your indifferent will, but to your nature. Because we're persons of a particular nature where our flourishing is, in a sense, already given. Um, according to the goods that, that, that perfect us. So it's just all the things we recognize that... that that do contribute to, to human flourishing. So, uh, the good of the family, you know, the good of the city, uh, all of my own particular goods, like clothing, you know, shelter, um, education. These are all not just products of my own choice, but at a certain level, there's a recognition that just I, as a human being, you know, need these things, independent of my own likes or dislikes. This is what contributes to my flourishing. Uh, and, and whereas the animals, you know, pursue the goods of their nature by instinct, that's what Aristotle and, and Aquinas recognize as the glory of man, that we move towards those same goods, providentially given, uh, of our own powers, by intellect and will, by knowing and loving. That's the glory of, of the human person. What distinguishes man is not simply the ability to choose between contraries, but actually to move toward what is good and excellent, perfects our nature of our own powers, not just by instinct, but by knowing the good and, and loving it. So um, I think that's why it matters. It's just because that's, that's who we are. And to settle for an understanding of freedom that's less than that, ah, uh, I, I think the ancients would say it's something a little less than human. Uh, if you were to talk to a libertarian mm -hmm. um, who might write off uh, Aquinas or Aristotle, uh, how would you, what would be your, your best way of going about and convincing him or her uh, that uh, pursuing of the, the good of excellence is that uh, philosophy is superior to mere license? It's hard, because I think it's, because uh, I've had discussions like this, and uh, I mean, it's hard to discuss, I mean, the good with someone who just rejects teleology, you know, off, uh, you know, out of hand. That, that, um, so I think that there's two things you have to convince them of. One, that there really are goods <laughs> outside uh, of the person. They do exist, uh, you know, outside of the person, outside of their usefulness. To any individual person, they're, they're goods of nature um, and, uh, and, and contribute to human flourishing, whether or not we find them useful uh, or not in a given moment. So I think that's, that's one thing you know, to convince them of. Corollary to that is to convince them that there are goods out there more important than one's particular good. So and that's the whole conversation about the common good, that, that, that the common good ranks higher in dignity and nobility and, and purpose than in one's own particular good. And so Aristotle, Aquinas, and all of them talk about how then the common good is to be loved more than the, com the particular good because of its excellence in itself. So that's one conversation. The other, I think it, it might be easier, is just to convince them that we, we can only act in, in reference to some good. All of our action is, is end-oriented you know, to, to some, uh, in, in some way, such that we can't move towards something unless it's even perceived as a good. Aristotle and Aquinas are very clear on that, that the will doesn't engage in something that it thinks is evil. Um, it is evil and we move towards it. We only do so because we, we perceive it in some way to be good, an apparent good. So that there's, you know, it's built into human action, movement toward a good, either the desire of the passion the recognition of it by the intellect, uh, but also the, 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 the movement towards it by, by will. Uh, that, that's all integral to what human action is. There's always, action is always, always for an end. So you can't escape TVR. 
And that that's, might be a longer conversation, but I think it might be the easier one to begin with, um, to show that the good is part and parcel of, of what it is to be human. And that is defined other than just use. So there's a difference between law and the laws. And mm -hmm. it strikes me that we have a problem because we make far too many laws mm -hmm. and they can't always really be, we, we can't always um, truly be wise enough to work toward the good. So we, we have a bit of a problem <laughs> on our hands. Mm -hmm. well, I think part of it is it maybe that points to the question I asked. I mean, for whom are we making laws today? You know, according to what notion of freedom? You know, because it does seem like a lot of the laws we do make today, at least in the, the codification of rights, is understanding of um, freedom being indifferent to the good, that the good is established by choice, and therefore the purpose of law is to maximize choice for the individual um, in such a way that individuals aren't bumping into each other you know, all the time. Um, and that was seen a long time ago. I mean, uh, if you read... Um, I mean, the early, I mean, this was the anthropology that somebody like Karl Marx, I mean, seized upon. I mean, that, that's, that's the view of freedom for which he constructs all of his political and economic theory to achieve, basically, the individual to do what it is that he or she wants. But so many other things are essentially taken care of so that you can just maximize choice. As he writes, you want to get up in the morning and go hunting, you can go hunting. If you want to get up in the morning, go fishing, go fishing. If you want to spend your afternoon editing books, you can do that. Uh, you know, this is in, in his early writings where he maps out his anthropology. This was the goal, you know, for him. Uh, the human person viewed as kind of mastering this, this freedom of, of indifference, not seeking the excellent according to nature, excellence according to nature, but, but uh, the maximization of, of the freedom of and even democracies can fall into that. I mean, insofar as the way we treat rights today kind of betrays the way um, that this is the, the accepted notion of freedom, even for us. How the church speaks of, with uh, religion, for instance, the need of a right to conscience so that the person is able to freely choose to pursue that good because it would thereby be a genuine act of worship. And that's certainly believed to be a, a good right. for everyone to pursue a r religious uh, observance, especially a Christian religious observance. How do you see that we should balance the necessity of that freedom to choose for oneself to pursue the good and law as, right. a, as a guide, as right. Aquinas sees it? I mean, there's no question that, I mean, just for states to function, law has to be authoritative. So there, there, there's no question about that. But I think that's why I said at the end it's an authoritative counsel, that, that law ideally speaks first to one's intellect and not to their will. So that there's, law indicates what the good is, so that the person in their own prudence, which is to say by their own conscience, through deliberation, judgment, and command, of their own powers, you know, uh, uh, do the good thing and the right thing, and what it is that the state establishes you know, to be just. Um, the effect may be the same, because yeah, obedience to the law is, is going to happen, but the question is how? You know, is it simply because the wills of citizens are bound to do it, and they do so kind of mindlessly, or because they're actually informed intellectually by the law to pursue the good that hopefully the, the law indicates? So those are, that's two different things. So it's two different ways of following the law, two different ways in which law can function. Aristotle, certainly for Aquinas, uh, you know, law was, was first, uh, you know, addressed to, to the intellect of, of the individual, not, not written or seen 
principally as, as something binding immediately on, on will. Even though it's authoritative and it does command certain action, uh, the goal is to have the citizen follow the law intelligently uh, and not simply mindless. Thank you. Good evening. I'm uh, Austin Lapari, Vice President of the D.C. Chapter of the Thomistic Institute. And on behalf of uh, the D.C. Chapter, I'd like to offer our thanks to Father Aquinas uh, for his excellent remarks. And uh, our thanks to uh, Dr. Crawford for his generous hospitality uh, and hosting us here at the Kirby Center uh, this evening. Uh, the Thomistic Institute promotes the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas and subsequent Thomistic tradition. While deeply rooted in the sources of, Western, of the Western intellectual tradition, the Institute strives to engage contemporary discourse and thought. Through this, the Capitol Hill chapter, <coughs> the Capitol Hill chapter in DC, excuse me, uh, the Thomistic Institute strives to educate policymakers and young professionals so as to enrich the nation's political discourse. And so our next event will be on March 29th, and uh, that will feature Father Thomas Joseph White on Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness, a 13th century take on natural rights. Um, and so if you see, uh, if you outside there's a table set up, and on that table uh, they have Father Thomas Joseph's pamphlet, Thomism and the New Evangelization, so you can sort of get a sneak peek at Father Thomas Joseph's uh, thought. Uh, and also set up on that table is some, um, uh, some publications from Clooney Media, uh, which is working... Um, uh, with the Dominicans to reprint uh, some uh, classics of the Catholic intellectual tradition. And uh, so with that, uh, please join us outside for refreshments. <laughs>